Elephants are one of the most iconic animals to currently inhabit our world, and their fascinating anatomies and behaviours makes them a favourite amongst many people. But how did these creatures come to be the way they are today? And just how many living species of elephant are there? Elephants are members of a mammalian superorder called Afrotheria, which includes other organisms such as aardvarks, hyraxes, and manatees and dugongs, as well as several other lineages. The close relationships between all these creatures is supported by both physical and genetic evidence, and within Afrotheria the elephants are included in a smaller grouping, the Order Proboscidea. There are many extinct families of proboscideans, such as the Dinotheres, the Mammotids, and the Gomphotheres, but here we'll be focusing on the one remaining family, the Elephantids. The extinct mammoths are also members of the Elephantid family, but there are only two genera in this grouping that are actually still alive today, Elephus and Loxodonta. Elephus is the genus name given to the Asian elephant, as well as numerous other extinct forms such as the Sulawesi dwarf elephant, and the single surviving species within Elephus is Elephus maximus. This species is widely distributed across the Asian mainland, as well as on several islands, though historically the range used to be larger. Physically smaller than their African relatives, these animals are able to achieve lengths of up to 6.5 metres, as well as heights of about 3 metres at the shoulder and around 5 tonnes in weight. Other characteristics that distinguish them from the elephants found in Africa include the size of their ears, which are far smaller, the shape of the forehead, and the number of nails on the feet, since Asian elephants have 5 on the forefeet and 4 on the hind feet, as opposed to the African bush elephant, which generally have 4 nails on the front and 3 on the back, though the forest elephant can have the same arrangement as the Asian elephant. Asian elephants also possess just one finger-like process on the tip of the trunk, whereas African elephants have two. Going down to even smaller taxonomic rankings, there are three subspecies of Asian elephant, and one population that may be a distinct subspecies, though it has not yet been officially recognised as such. The largest of these subspecies, the Sri Lankan elephant, Elephus maximus maximus, today only inhabits various fragmentary areas on the island of Sri Lanka. These animals can be distinguished from other subspecies by their overall darker coloration, as well as the larger, more distinctive areas of depigmentation, which appear as pink patches of skin. Then there's the Indian elephant, Elephus maximus indicus, which is a very widespread subspecies spanning across many mainland Asian countries, including India, China, Vietnam, and down into the Malay Peninsula. Indian elephants are lighter skins than the Sri Lankan subspecies, and have smaller patches of depigmentation. These creatures are also fairly generalist animals, living in both grasslands and forests, and herds move over very large areas of land. The next subspecies is the Sumatran elephant, Elephus maximus sumatranus, a critically endangered taxon that today survives in fragmented populations on the island of Sumatra and numbers no more than 3,000 individuals. The coloration of this subspecies is lighter than the others, and has the least amount of depigmentation. Finally there's the Borneo elephant, or the Borneo pygmy elephant, the origin of which is currently not fully agreed upon. There is some evidence to suggest that these animals may be descended from a captive population of perhaps Indian or Sumatran elephants that was released on Borneo sometime in the 18th century whereas another idea, supported by a 2003 DNA analysis, suggests that the elephants are actually native to Borneo, arriving there in the Pleistocene and subsequently being isolated from other populations for around 300,000 years. Or an alternative idea is that they may be a relict population of Javan elephants that were introduced at some point, since they are so genetically distinct. So, how did all these Asian elephant subspecies evolve, and what is the overall species' closest relative? The genus Elephus actually had its origin in Africa, with the African elephant splitting off from the Asian lineage about 7.6 million years ago. Interestingly, there is a great deal of DNA evidence demonstrating that Asian elephants are in fact more closely related to the extinct mammoths than they are to the African elephant genus, and once Elephus had originated in the Pliocene of Africa, they moved out of the continent and into Eurasia, eventually colonising the southern part of the Asian continent and islands, and evolving into all the subspecies we can see today. Meanwhile, the very closely related mammoth genus, Mammothus, spread out of Africa too, moving into Europe, Northern Asia, and eventually into North America and then down into Central America, speciating into the famous forms such as the woolly mammoth and the enormous Colombian mammoth as they colonised new areas. 
Some members of the genus also found their way to various islands, and dwarf species appeared as a result, such as the Channel Islands Mammoth, descended from the Columbian Mammoth, and the Cretan Dwarf Mammoth found on Mediterranean islands. So, what about the African elephants? For a long time, it was thought that the animals that inhabited Africa were all members of the same species, but more recently, evidence has mounted that suggests there are, in fact, two very distinct species of African elephant in the genus Loxodonta. The largest of the living elephant species is the African bush or savanna elephant, Loxodonta africana, which can achieve heights of more than 3 meters and sometimes almost 4 meters, as well as weights of over 10 tons in the very largest males, while females are generally quite a bit smaller. The bush elephants can be found all across the grass plains and bushland of central and southern Africa, though they are threatened by the continued habitat fragmentation they're facing. Tusks are present in both males and females of this species, unlike the Asian elephant in which most females either lack tusks or may have very small ones, and throughout the lifetime of the animal these structures continue to grow. These organisms have many adaptations to the hot environments they live in, such as wrinkly skin to increase their surface area, and their famous ears, which are said to resemble the continent of Africa, that have a large number of blood vessels close to the skin. This allows for easier regulation of body temperature by cooling the blood, and when the elephants get too hot, they will fan their ears to increase the airflow over them. Bush elephants are relatively well studied due to the more open environments they tend to favour, and they stick together in family units of about 10 females with their calves, led by a single matriarch. The family units can sometimes combine into huge clans numbering several hundred elephants. Male elephants will only join the groups during periods of mating and are usually more loosely associated in groups of just males. The other kind of African elephant is the African forest elephant, suggested to be named Loxodonta cyclotis, and they differ from the bush elephant in a number of ways. Perhaps most obviously, these animals are generally smaller than the other African elephants, reaching heights at the shoulder of around 2.5 metres and 2.7 tonnes in weight, though the largest individuals can approach 6 tonnes. Another distinction that can be made between the bush and forest elephants is that forest elephants have ears that are a lot more rounded, and their tusks are in general much straighter, thinner and shorter than the bush elephants. However, these structures are still incredibly strong, and they're used to push through the thickly vegetated regions where these animals live. Forest elephants inhabit areas of Central Africa too, and, as their name suggests, can be found living in jungle and forested environments, as well as out on open plains. The more diminutive size of these animals enables them to be better adapted than bush elephants would be at moving through the dense jungles, but unfortunately the forest habitats they live in are under severe threat as deforestation and the effects of climate change result in these regions becoming increasingly fragmented. Now, not only are there physical and behavioural differences between African bush and forest elephants, but there's also accumulating genetic evidence suggesting that they should be classed as distinct species. Support for this separation properly began in 2001, when a study examined tissue samples from multiple populations of elephants, and found that the genes of forest elephants are actually very different compared to those of bush elephants. The recognition of two African species gained further support in 2010, when another study, which looked at the nuclear DNA sequences of all the living elephants, as well as mastodons and mammoths, found that bush and forest elephants are at least as distinct as Asian elephants and mammoths, and possibly more so, with the two species having diverged from one another any time between 2 and 7 million years ago. Even more developments to do with the distinction of these animals occurred in 2016, when it was discovered that an extinct elephantid known as the straight-tusked elephant, Paleoloxodon antiquus, is in fact more closely related to the African forest elephant than the forest elephant is to the bush elephant. Before this study, it was thought that the straight-tusked elephant was a closer relative of the Asian elephants, since its morphology more closely resembled those animals. However, by analysing the genome of this species, from two samples of Paleoloxodon aged 120,000 years old, it was found that they were much closer to African forest elephants on the evolutionary tree than to any other living species. In this study, the genomes of four woolly mammoth individuals were also used, in addition to the genome of a Colombian mammoth and two American mastodons. Through the use of these other species' genetics, the study also reveals that elephanted evolution was not exactly quite as simple as had been previously thought. There was a lot of interbreeding amongst all these species at various times in the distant past. 
For example, the straight-tusked elephant, although being closely related to the modern-day forest elephant, had actually also mated with Asian elephants and mammoths at some point, since its genome contained traces of these other organisms. Not only that, but African bush and forest elephants also appear to have interbred with one another in the past, even after they had already diverged from their common ancestor. Genetic admixture is the name given to the presence of DNA from distinct lineages in a certain organism's genome as the result of interbreeding between different species, and it's likely that this took place once Paleoloxodon had moved out of Africa and into Eurasia, where the animal would have then mated with Asian elephants and woolly mammoths. This study therefore showed that elephant evolution has been a very messy, complicated process with a lot of gene flow between species in the past. But importantly, it also states that in more recent times, since about 500,000 years ago, there has been almost complete isolation between forest and bush elephants, and despite gene flow occurring between them at some point in their evolutionary histories, and the fact that hybrids do sometimes appear today, the data provides even more compelling evidence that these are distinct organisms. So, all this is to say that there's a lot of pretty good support for the classification of two species within Loxodonta, Africana and Cyclotis. However, the forest elephant is not considered a separate species by everyone. The International Union for Conservation of Nature is the organisation that composes the Red List, which is a collection of the conservation statuses of every assessed species on Earth. The list is used by governments and organisations across the entire world in their conservation efforts, and so it's an incredibly important tool for securing the future of our planet's biodiversity. But the IUCN currently does not recognise the forest elephant as a unique species. This is because, in the African elephant's last assessment in 2008, the assessors decided that premature allocation into more than one species may leave hybrids in an uncertain conservation status basing this statement on what a specialist research group had determined in 2003. However, as is now clear from all the evidence and data that has been gathered since then, the IUCN really should update their assessment with the new science. By classing these creatures into a single species, it hides the true vulnerability of the forest elephant, especially since work published in 2016 revealed that poaching has a more devastating effect on this species compared to the bush elephant, as the populations increase at a slower rate. Forest elephant numbers have decreased alarmingly in recent years, with an estimated 62% of these animals having been wiped out by poaching for ivory between 2003 and 2013, and there is a very real possibility that we could lose these animals within the next decade. The forest elephant needs to be officially recognised as a separate species before it's too late, and these animals, with their unique genetics that tell a rich history of elephant evolution, become extinct. There are, of course, ongoing conservation efforts to preserve this species, with organisations such as the African Forest Elephant Foundation working to prevent further poaching and save the animal's forest habitats, and hopefully we are able to stop the decline of this unique, lesser-known elephant before they are lost forever. Now before I end this video, I just need to let you know that for the next two or three months we will be switching the Sunday videos to an every other week schedule, since we all have exams coming up and we need more time to concentrate on them. We didn't want to completely abandon the channel for so long though, and so by doing videos every other week it allows us to still be able to make content over the exam period, although the videos may end up being slightly shorter than usual. We'll also try to continue making 7 Days of Science every week for as long as we can, but Animal of the Week will probably go on hold for a while too. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.